Welcome to Smithsonian American Art Museum's Virtual Artist Program with Erica Lord and Maggie Thompson, who are two of the artists included in the Renwick Invitational 2023, on view in Washington, D.C. through March 2024. Closed captions are available. You can enable them by clicking the CC button on the bottom of your screen. This program is being recorded and will be available on Smithsonian American Art Museum's YouTube channel. SAM program staff will share information with you via the chat. During the program, please use the Q&A feature to ask our speakers your questions. There will be a time during the program devoted to answering them. At the end of the program, please take a moment to complete our post-program survey to provide us with feedback on your experience. Please leave your browser window open to access the survey. We ask that you adhere to the SI terms of use found in the chat, and we reserve the right to remove off-topic questions, as well as the right to ask anyone to leave if their behavior is deemed inappropriate. Welcome, and thank you for joining us this evening. I am Dr. Laura Evans, a citizen of Cherokee Nation and the curator for the exhibition. Additionally, I am Vice President of Programs at First Peoples Fund, which is a Native Arts nonprofit. I'm coming to you today from Ogopoge, also known as Santa Fe, New Mexico. On behalf of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, I will share the following land acknowledgement. This evening, we gratefully acknowledge the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home in the Washington, D.C. region, and the Native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we are gathered. We encourage you to explore this map linked in the chat to learn more about the Indigenous communities to be honored and recognized wherever you are joining us from today. Our guests are Erica Lord and Maggie Thompson, two of the six artists in the Smithsonian American Art Museum's Runwick Invitational 2023. The Rhina and Melvin Cohen Family Foundation Endowment provides support for the Renwick Invitational. The Cohen family's generosity helps make possible this series, highlighting outstanding craft artists who are deserving of wider recognition nationally. Sharing Honors and Burdens is the 10th in this series of invitational exhibitions. Conversations around American craft routinely express fear that craft practices will be lost, die out, or cease to be practiced. There is anxiety over a loss of tradition. Similar language is often expressed in connection to Native American peoples and our cultural traditions. This framing, however, assumes traditions to be static, as if a snapshot at a particular moment should be preserved forever. And if we fail at that, we lose. However, traditions are living practices and must continually adapt to new conditions in order to thrive. Artists are the experimenters. Art is the testing ground for the many ways we might carry very intentionally the past into the future. The theme and title of the exhibition is Sharing Honors and Burdens. While many of the works in the exhibition have culturally specific references, they're also meant to communicate across cultural boundaries and invite us to think us to think about the burdens we carry, literally and metaphorically, the knowledge we've been given and how we share it responsibly, as well as the burdens we perhaps wish we did not have to bear. These themes are present in the works in the exhibition, but cannot encapsulate the whole of each of these artists' creative practice. For today's program, each artist will share a 10 minute overview of their work, including key artworks in the exhibition, followed by conversation and audience questions. On November 16th, you may wish to join in another virtual event with artists from the same exhibition. Geo Neptune and Lily Hope will be in conversation with Darian Turner, Assistant Curator of Indigenous Art of the Americas at the Baltimore Museum of Art. And for now, um, uh, our first presenter will be Maggie Thompson. Maggie Thompson is a fiber artist and knitwear designer. She gains inspiration from her Ojibwe heritage, exploring family history, 
as well as broader themes relevant to what's happening now. Over to you, Maggie. Uh, hello, thank you, Laura um, and Renwick for having me here. Um, I am just going to pull out my presentation real quick. Um, yeah, so hello, uh, my name is Maggie Thompson. I am Fond du Lac Ojibwe and was born and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I am a practicing textile artist and designer. Both of my parents were artists, so I was very fortunate to be surrounded by art and creativity starting at a very young age. My dad was a graphic designer and a musician, and my mom is a painter. Growing up, I taught myself how to do beadwork and learn how to knit at a Waldorf school, but mostly did painting and printmaking all through high school. Growing up, my education was always rooted in the arts, and I ended up going to college where I earned my um, Bachelor of Fine Arts in Textiles from the Rhode Island School of Design, uh, graduating in 2013. During my time at RISD, we were pushed to work and play hard through the exploration of concepts, materials, color, pattern, and structure. And we learned everything from uh, print design, hand knitting and weaving, all the way to programming and using industrial knitting and weaving uh, machines. Um, in school, my classes were geared more towards design and product development, but my cohort and I lean more towards fine arts. So for my senior thesis, I began to create work about the connection to my own native identity, critiquing cultural appropriation and how I saw native people being represented in mainstream fashion, culture and in institutions. Uh, many people assume that uh, natives are all the same, that we all wore headdresses and lived in teepees, when in reality, there's a tremendous amount of diversity. So these cookie cutters are 3D printed and they represent the way mainstream culture represents uh, Native American culture, cultural icons and designs and how it reinforces uh, misinformed generic ideas of Indian or what it means to be Native. Coming from Minnesota, I was surrounded by a large Native population, and it wasn't until moving to the East Coast that I felt othered, uh, to the point where people would ask to shake my hand because it was the first time meeting someone who was Native American. Uh, this dress is a direct response to that feeling of being othered. A nickname in college was Pocahontas, uh, so I created this machine knit dress based off of that experience and um, and a jingle dress using beer caps for the jingles that then becomes culturally seductive. Further thinking on my identity and connection to culture, I um, created this work, um, which I think started started one of my earlier works in my career. Um, but thinking about identity and connection to culture, um, it relates to blood quantum, which is the amount of Indian blood that an individual possesses. It was initially a system uh, that the federal government placed onto tribes in an effort to limit their citizenship and is still used by uh, many tribes today. Uh, family portrait represents that blood quantum of my parents and of myself. Uh, my dad is mostly native and my mom is Irish and German. And even though I'm mostly white, I still identify as being native, but why? In this piece, I am exploring and qu questioning those ideas and systems of authenticity. After school, I moved back home to Minnesota so I could be closer to family and community. Minnesota is one of the largest and most tribally diverse urban native populations with 11 federally recognized tribes between the Dakota and Ojibwe people. Maggie, would it be possible to either move the microphone closer or speak a bit louder? Yes. Right. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, any better? Um, anyway. Try it again. Can you hear me better? From here not really okay project right. i'm trying I'm, okay, okay. Yep. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah um but wanting to participate in the native and broader art scene of the twin cities i opened up my own studio practice at the northrop king building which is a collective of artist studios within the northeast arts district of minneapolis minnesota has a thriving arts community um with, and is known for its support for artists and financial resources for artists. Pictured here is uh, an inspiration wall. I often create smaller samples, exploring different ideas, uh, materials, concepts, and this wall just includes everything like family photos, uh, lyrics, um, trinkets, images, samples, anything um, 
just to keep keep me feeling inspired while I work. Um, and then, yeah, and then it's also in the studio, I run a business called Makwa Studio, uh, where I run, um, which covers my fine art and my knitwear practice. Makwa means bear um, in Ojibwe. Being that we're in Minnesota where it's cold, we mostly make uh, winter items such as cowls, hats, and scarves. So here are just a couple of our different patterns and designs. All of our um, items are knit on a hand flat knitting machine. Knitwear and textile process involves a lot of structural and pattern related thinking, which keeps it engaging. Um, I love learning about all the different structural techniques that can be done on the machine and experimenting with color play within my patterns and art pieces. We also recently fundraised and purchased an industrial knitting machine, which will be used for both business and fine art. Um, kind of what Laura was talking about, native art is often labeled into a single generic category and is often viewed as something static. Um, and that in order for it to be authentic, it needs to look traditional or reference something historical, be stuck in the past. So we really seek to challenge these preconceptions, or I seek to challenge these preconceptions within my own work through my concepts, trying and combining new techniques and through the materials I use. And I'm really interested in the evolution of um, native art and how it is currently changing with new technology. Um, and these are just a few of our goals. So like collaborating with other artists, interested in wealth distribution, learning about investing as a business. I'd love to start a scholarship program with students interested in textiles, maybe purchase a building, and then also have funds available for uh, community um, need projects, which leads me um, to those. So some of the projects we've done in the past include the Ribbon Mass Project, uh, which was done during the pandemic, speaking to the strength and resiliency of Native people using ribbon because of its symbolism and how easily identifiable it is from one Native person to another to seek that connection during a time of isolation. Um, to also creating masks and reinforced umbrellas as a response um, during the protests of murder, um, response to the murder of George Floyd and Dante Wright during the protests um, to protect protesters from coronavirus, uh, tear gas and rubber bullets, and the ability to have a studio space that we can quickly in turn into um, something else to bring people together to address these community needs is something that I hope to continue doing into the future. Another part of uh, the studio is offering internship opportunities um, where we mentor Native and non-Native students working in the art field, where they help on production and exhibit ex ex oh my goodness, exhibit installations. And then I, I love working with younger people because they keep me on my toes and I feel like I um, end up learning just uh, if not, sorry, I'm stumbling. I just they keep, I feel like they teach me just as much, or if not more, oh my goodness. They teach me just as much as I hope I am teaching them. Thank you for your patience. Um, lately, I have been also doing a lot of work related to relationships, grief and loss. Um, each of my pieces are built around a strong, uh, personal conceptual narrative. Um, I like to think through the hard stuff. Um, so about, sorry, how grief um, is highly personal where every individual's process is unique and also how everybody experiences loss and how that connects us. This here is a poem um, I wrote someone in fifth grade, a relationship that I recently had to let go of. So living with a living loss. Um, it's made out of fabric stuffed with pellets, feeling very innocent um, and childlike. I also love playing with and combining materials. Uh, this piece, Breadcrumbing, is about the act of leading someone on, so creating an illusion of building a life together or other acts of service without the follow through, an illusion of a fence built out of clear vinyl filled with actual breadcrumbs. Um, it then becomes a facade in all of its physical and emotional forms. This is just a detail. Uh, quantum entanglement is about the relationship between two individual particles or pictured here, two hearts connected with a magnetic field of beadwork. In the microscopic realm, um, once two particles experience a shared state, they are no longer separate entities, but exist as one. This remains true even when they are separated by a great distance. 
So this can be seen between uh, couples, any romantic relationships, friends, parents, their kids, an animal. It's just about that unexplainable connection between two people or two, two things. Um, which now brings me to the work at the Renwick. So this piece um, is called The Equivocator, and it has a quote that goes with it. Uh, a belly tied in knots with the red flags that you so delicately placed but insisted did not exist. Uh, this piece is about listening to your gut and paying attention to the warning signs within a toxic relationship. So it's made out of stockings and rope that's um, like tied up and knotted and um, it's, I, you can like feel it in your body. Um, the other two works in the show are On Loving, which is on the left, and then uh, I Get Mad on the right. I Get Mad is about deciphering between the words and actions of a person, how excuses for bad behavior can be made through the use of words um, such as I love you, leaving the person navigating a psychologically abusive relationship even more confused. Um, this piece is made out of different shades of white and clear beads and is entirely hand loomed where you could have up to three to four people working on it as a, at a time and is finished with jingles, um, which represent healing. And then On Loving um, is a series of body bags in relation to the collective loss and grief of COVID. Uh, when folks were unable to come together to mourn their loved ones, they, um, they each have a star pattern on them and are heavily beaded as a way to honor the lost loved one. All the larger diamonds were uh, created separately and then put together and they're all hand quilted on the inside, which is a little secret because you can't see in the show. Um, during this uh, process of making work, um, I also, uh, in addition to hired help, I um, ended up having to call on community to get and social media for volunteers to help bead with this part of um, the project um, where I thought I would be making these alone. They ended up being made by over 50 individuals. So I just wanted to share a few of the faces involved in the process of making that work. Um, we had people from all over the Twin Cities coming um, from all different ages, different belief systems, identities. I had people even reaching out from out of town who wanted to be involved in the work. Uh, some were family, friends, friends of family and friends. Others were just artists, or not just artists, other artists. Um, people I hadn't met before, um, people who were following, and then honestly, just people walking by the studio who were curious. Um, there were many late nights and deep conversations, tears and laughter that came out of these pieces. And then by the end of the project, we had fostered a creative and regenerative space for community which in the end felt more appropriate for the pieces as they were never meant to be built alone. Um, and this is why I love creating art. It's a way for people to connect uh, despite their differences in language or where they come from. And if I can help, if I can move someone um, just by them looking at my art, then that is how I define a successful piece. Um, so and here it is installed at the Renwick and yeah, uh, thank you, Laura, for um, everything and Renwick for for the opportunity. Miigwech. Thank you so much, Maggie. Um, next up is going to be Erica Lord. Erica Lord is an interdisciplinary artist born to a Finnish American mother and an Athabascan and Nupiat father. She explores themes of displacement, cultural identity, and cultural limbo, often in relationship to contemporary Indigenous experience. She is well known for her performative photographic works, in addition to installation and sculptural work. Erica, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, we were having some technical issues earlier, so if anything goes wrong, please let me know. <laughs> Um, hi, uh, just gonna launch into the screen. Is that showing up full screen? All right. Yeah. So, um, my name is Erica Lord. Thanks. Laura, thank you, Laura, for introducing me. And I, um, I'm originally from Alaska. I grew up between there and Upper Michigan. And I am, as Laura mentioned, Athabascan from Central Alaska. 
Anupiak from Northern Alaska, and then Finnish, Swedish, English, and Japanese, or um, circumpolar. <laughs> Often I'll introduce myself as. Let's see. So this is just a kind of map to show you guys where exactly I'm from. So I grew up in almost right in the center of Alaska, um, pretty far north, and grew up there until I was about six years old. And then when my parents split up, moved to Upper Michigan, um, or the UP, where I grew up between Chatham and Houghton, and uh, moving back and forth between families, between cultures, and locations, I think really influenced me, and just uh, forming my identity. A lot of my work deals with what it means to be a mixed race Native woman at this time in, in this society. <laughs> um, in Alaska, I grew up with sled dogs. Um, that I was, we had a pretty, a relatively small team, which was about 33 dogs when I left Alaska, which may seem like a lot to other people, but I, for a large, um, medium to large team, if you're racing something like the Iditarod or the Yukon Quest, people have between 90 and 100 dogs. So when I moved to Michigan, I thought it was unusual that people there only had one or two dogs. And I didn't know what to think about that. Um, but I grew up uh, with, yeah, 33 dogs. And so this is me and my father on the left side with our lead dog. Just the image of dog sledding on the right side. And people use them for survival, um, for racing. And so between three and six, I grew up racing dogs. So there's a picture of me on the left side when I was about three or four years old. And on the right side, as an adult with my cousin, um, getting ready to just go on a fun ride with my dad and um, famed award winning or medal winning dog racer, Charlie Bolding on the right side. So a lot of my work is influenced by um, looking at historic objects and trying to figure out how they can become relevant to my contemporary life and how they, I can bring together that historic and contemporary ideas together. So this uh, image in the middle is my great grandfather, Chief Thomas of Ninana and his family. And on the left side um, is dog blankets or tuppies puppies for puppies um, on the left side and on the right side an image of a traditional baby blanket or burden strap and burden straps kind of exist in multiple um, cultures and backgrounds but so these are the two main objects that I was influenced by for the, my installation at the Renwick called the codes we carry so here's an image of a traditional baby belt this is probably about five to six feet long with these long tassels. So children, anything to do with children um, is highly like, honored. And so those objects are heavily beaded. You can tell the entire thing is beaded with seed beads or the tiniest beads. And then having those like long tassels on the end. Um, for, a, for context, this is just a close up of one of the dog blankets or tuppies. So dog blankets were not functional in the sense that they helped warm a dog. It was more of a kind of fancy or elaborate um, thing that you would put on a dog. Like if you had a potlatch or a ceremony in a village, people might bring, um, ride their dogs up to about like a mile or so outside of the village and then stop them to dress them with these dog blankets so that it was sort of a ceremonial or um you know, jingly way of entering the village. So the way that I brought these two things together is a friend of mine is a microbiologist and he showed me these images years ago that he explained that these are DNA or RNA microarray analyses. And so what, they're very colorful and pretty, <laughs> but whenever you get tested for disease um, or condition, that might affect your DNA or RNA, they take uh, samples of your DNA and either grid it on a slide or on a test strip. And the colors and patterns will tell you whether or not you have a disease and how much or how advanced it is. So, um, oops. 
So this is how I brought the two things together. I was thinking about like, you know, I don't carry babies or bundles of sticks or jugs of water around with me. So what is my burden? And so I thought um, diabetes. So I started looking at diseases that affect native populations disproportionately and taking published copies of any of those DNA or my, uh, microarrays and applying it onto the burden belts or dog tuppies so that this one on the left side, actually both of them, uh, show different images of a diabetes burden strap. So this is my process. Similar to Maggie's, we have multiple people working on a single project at any given time. Um, these are two of my assistants um, showing how we take these uh, colorful, like in the top right image, you can see a little bit of one of the test strips. And so we break it up and figure out a way to mathematically adapt it so that when we blow these tests up, the relationship is a one-to-one -one relationship between the test and the final product. But we use those test strips to organize them on these adapted tile grids. And then once we organize them on the tail grids, they put them on these wires and the wires then get handed off to. So the weaver who helps weave it into these custom made um, bead looms. When I first started out, I went to the bean store and I asked them for a big loom, which is about creates um, an object about the size of a bracelet. And they were like, how big did you need? And I was like, between six or seven feet, perhaps. And they're like, yeah, they don't make those. So I had to build my own loom. And on in this one, we can have two people working on two halves of one test at any time. And there's Laura helping me organize beads. So these are some of the first examples. My diabetes burden strap on the top, breast cancer burden strap on the bottom. And with the test in the same image, you can see how it's a direct relationship between the test and the final woven product. It's my nephrology or nephropathy um, or kidney complications due to diabetes. My multiple myeloma burden strap, which is when we started incorporating all of the long tassels into this. And so this one is about seven feet wide by two feet tall and how it might look on a mannequin so that people can understand how similar to the baby belts, it would droop in the back and then tie up front. My second half of the projects was uh, I wanted to make a dog team since um, my personal relationship to dog racing, but also connected to this historic um, 1925 serum run, which is when... Um, Sorry, um, 1925 Sarum run, which is when the village of Nome was dying of diphtheria and had to figure out how to get the serum or the cure to the village. And with bad weather, you can't really fly it in. So um, starting from the top or the lead dog down to the bottom, I thought I'd start with that history of diphtheria and then go next to examples of tests that we have learned um, learned or adapted um, cures or vaccines from. So smallpox and tuberculosis in the second position, uh, diabetes and ovarian cancer in third position, and then two different COVID examples on the bottom or fourth position. So some people may have heard of Balto or Togo. These are two of the lead dogs that helped finish this historic run. Um, so they got the serum from Anchorage up to my village of Ninana. Uh, by train. And then from Ninana to Nome, they handed it off between over 100 dogs and 20 different racers that handed this serum off um, one to one um, until it got to Nome and saved the village. There's two movies on each of these dogs, too, Balto and Togo. And so, just a quick example of the different up close ups one from the test on the left and the final piece on the right side. And similar to Maggie, she also uses jingles. And I, um, so since these are tests of diseases, oops, I wanted to surround them with medicine. And so those type of cone-shaped jingles um, 
uh, when used on jingle dresses and powwows and stuff are seen as a sort of healing medicine. And so I thought for each disease, I would surround it with medicine. Tuberculosis, diabetes, ovarian cancer, uh, COVID, COVID-1, and then COVID-2. And so here's the final installation um, with the dog sled you can see on the back half of the thing and the lead dog up front. And me next to it. And so just wanted to honor those dogs and the people that helped save Gnome and a lot of things because then just as now, dogs are essential to survival. One last thing I wanted to mention was that um, when they were working on an effort to get the COVID vaccine out to the villages, they called it Project Togo, named after Togo, the lead dog that helped finish that last race. On a best seat, thank you. Great, thank you, Erica. Thank you, Maggie. And thank you, Emma. <laughs> yeah, Maggie, please join us, yes. Right. And you can both have your microphones on now. Um, so now we're going to have a, a little conversation. And I wanted to bring up scale in each of your works. Um, you each chose to do large scale works made from teeny tiny objects, in this case, beads. Well, how, how did that come about? What was the significance of scale? Um, for each of these pieces. Yeah. Um, go first, Maggie. First, um, yeah, I mean, I, so I, at least for the loom work piece, I actually sized up a bead size. Um, but initially I um, was thinking like the smallest beads just because of, um, I guess, like the insanity of it one. And then it's <laughs> as you're like navigating something uh, very serious, um, but it just kind of like makes 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 a person go a little you know it's just hard um and then also one reason i really love working with beads or smaller materials to make something bigger is that it's i mean it's a the some um how did i say it i forget but um it's also just a way to i mean re it's relaxing it's meditative and then it's also working on topics of like grief and loss it's also a way to for you to like spend time with your thoughts to process and then also kind of another way to like spend time with the person that is no longer with you or that you ended a relationship with so kind of thinking about that and then especially when working on the the body bags it the beading process the handwork process and being within community like the the ability to like slow down and have conversation and share stories and that so it's like if you were working on something bigger, you just, the, the ability would be different, so. Yeah, I am, um, I really agree with Maggie that it was very meditative and having that time to sort of spend contemplating the objects, the things that like, you know, and first started out with the belts, these long belts, and I kept trying to think about different sizes or different object that I wanted to move to that was a different scale. And after working on these square grids over and over and over, I thought back to those uh, dog blankets that I first saw when I was an intern at the Smithsonian. And just something about the shape, like there's very few like aha moments I feel like in the studio. And I had this, um, these images of these DNA tests like floating through my head for years. And it wasn't until I was at the bead store in downtown Santa Fe that I came across these square cube beads and about that connecting to the shape or the of the data sort of pixelated data and made sense it was this like oh wait i know what i'm gonna do <laughs> like, and that these three different things were kind of floating around my head and at that moment it came together and also just kind of this i think about this relationship between like whole person being scaled down to dna and that dna being scaled down even more to these these coded tests and that in each case, it's just like up and down relationship. And what was the ex 
experience of making something so labor intensive? It was hard, challenging, um, but a lot of fun. I I mean, it's very rewarding. There's kind of like a moment where you're like, is this going to work? Um, and then it's, but it's kind of amazing to, I don't know. And I mean, you have to just like even the process of making it with so many people um, sharing the space. And then also just the amount, I think um, it's hard on your body. Like you really got to pay attention. So you're like thinking up in your head mm-hmm. and then you got to remember that you also have a body um, anyway. So I was thinking about that a lot while working on the, on the works. And I, um, yeah, anyways, first thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, we kept having to adapt the looms to compensate for our my aging body at least. <laughs> was bending over on a horizontal loom was really difficult, like and I would wear out quickly. And so we started building vertical looms, like they're attached to the wall now that like rotate out so that we don't have to be bent over the entire time. But I also kept thinking about this connection or relationship to like growing up in Alaska with potlatch culture. Are there are these huge events that, you know, an entire family or an entire village will get together to put this um, potlatch on. And so, like, being able to split up those jobs between people and sharing that experience of, like, working on this large-scale project, it's been really nice to, like, share that with students. Because, yeah, I work with a number of interns and apprentices from the Institute of American Indian Arts, where I teach, as well as the local high schools here and having people rotate in and out so that we're all kind of working towards this common goal is just really satisfying and nice. Now there's several different beading techniques that you could have chosen to to use for these works. Um, Could you talk a little bit about um, the choice to use um, loom weaving techniques and then and Maggie also used some other um, beading techniques in yours too. Yeah. I mean, I, um, loom work. I mean, I just, why loom work? I think as a weaver and then just, uh, I mean, I do enjoy loom work, um, and I've been wanting to do more. And then also I think it's cause it's very systematic and you have to like count and keep track of things. So it's like, I kind of like the idea just going with the concept that you're like creating order out of something chaotic um and then um for the other one it's just like a wrapping so each row is like tacked into the bead and I know like wrapping but it was just like another it was actually the first time I I had done like something similar to wrapping even though it was a little different um but just um learning something new trying something new yeah yeah I think um similar to the woodlands type beading where you're coming from Maggie we do primarily this like applique beading so like one string is holding the beads on second one is like yeah wrapping around it tacking it down to the backing and that's the only type of beading i would really done before besides necklaces or something but so when i came across loom beading like it made sense to me like you said in an organizational way on my finished side of the family all the women uh do rag rug looms like so i grew up with all these big looms and watching them kind of work away at that and so it just made sort of sense to work in that sort of linear fashion even though i would never done that before and yeah when we first started on this project like two and a half years ago it was like oh i can i can do all these things it'll be fine (laughs) and then like trying to adjust for time and scale and all that it definitely took a lot more work than i was expecting i think we counted by the end I had worked with, you know, like 16 or 17 assistants and uncountable number of us, like volunteers and family, um, Laura, (laughs) and just tons of people coming together. And I mean, on just, we only counted the beads on one of the belts and it was over 30,000 beads on one belt. And so like, I can't even fathom how many were actually on there. Were, were there supply chain problems with getting enough beads oh to do your projects? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Oh, think- loud, louder, Maggie. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, trying to find that many beads, I think there's like, it's like over 800,000 seed beads um, that are put on for the loom work piece. Um, just making sure you have enough. Um, it's hard to calculate. And then for the gold beads too on the body bags, but, and then even like ordering fabric. So like, or the vinyl, it's like during COVID um, and like starting the project, um, ordering some vinyl and then like dealing with different dye lots or like not being able to, I don't know. And then just the pushback Mm -hmm. of the ability to ship. I don't know. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of things with supplies, but that happened. But those were some of the, the problems that I ran into. Yeah, I for myself, like the when I first started working on these, like there was I was just eyeballing colors. So like I'll go back down to the bead store locally and not be able to find those same colors and freak out because every different store I was purchasing from all had their own names or codes for the beads, which were different from the supply codes for the beads. And that took a while just trying to figure out how to order the same color of beads. And there's like only two places that I'm aware of that I could order these um, square beads from wholesale and they kept changing up what beads were available or like you said dye lots like I would go to reorder something and the colors wouldn't match and like just and then COVID which slowed down everything like everything I was running into all the costs like elevated like everything from wood to anything connected to acrylic like it was you know constant like adapting and shifting and trying to figure out new answers to these constantly arising new problems. <laughs> well, we have some questions from the audience that I'm going to be sharing with you. Um, here's one comment. I love beading and I'm so impressed with the bead work. with beading as a meditative process. How much time did it take to complete these large projects? That is, I have some idea and, um, for, at least for the loom work piece, um, to do, I think we worked in, so we created it with strips. So like between five and eight inches in height and then working from left to right. And, um, it would take, um, on average about three hours to complete, um, an inch. Um, so you think about that and it's about four by six feet, um, in size. And then for the other one, I don't even know how to calculate time for that, but it was just like, it was a lot of hands and a lot of hours. Um, but yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah, it, it, it's almost impossible to count the number of hours because like I can count my interns hours but I it's not counting all the hours I put into it and like the space in between you know when I would do one by myself it would take me like a a year or something to complete one by myself and then having to quickly scale up to finish like three or four new belts and seven dogs like it started out with like oh I can do all these different things and then as time quickly ran on, like the amount of time it took to figure out the system, of course, took much longer at the beginning than it did tw- once we got a system down and like those different stages. And then again, each time like adapting and working so that instead of um, working, yeah, bottom to top on one loom, we split it into the two halves of looms so that we could work on two halves of the same test and then stitch them together in the middle. Um, the length, it's, I don't don't even know how to I mean literally two and a half years of nonstop work with all of those assistants like never took a break (laughs) yeah so I mean from the the beginning stages of planning the exhibition and and deciding what the works were going to be it was two and a half years total Hmm. that's a lot of work to accomplish in that amount of time yeah I know I put in a lot um, since the beginning of just this year, it was about 1500 hours plus mm-hmm. the addition of, um, hired help and volunteers. Um, so it's, yeah. so it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a labor of love. So, yeah. Yeah. I would um, say about 1500 per year, at least, but that's, 
counting one set of interns, not all of them. <laughs> I, mean, yep. I think I had up to four at one point, like at a time of four or five, six, something like that. It's really hard. <laughs> So Maggie, would you be willing to speak a little bit more about the the intuition and listening to one's gut and and that work? Yeah, I um I'm trying to think of what to say. So yeah, it's just um, trusting. So like paying attention to red flags, and it can be either in a romantic relationship, like a work relationship um friends um i feel like our body has you just the ability to warn and it's just it's all about the importance of like listening to that more times than not i can say like i i felt this in my body and i should have done this um and it's specific to just like again like that that piece and the beadwork piece are about like psychological um abusive uh, relationships specifically. So, um, when you're having a hard time deciphering things mentally, like really listen to your body. And then, um, yeah, I actually wrote the, the quote first and then the piece kind of like came out of that too. Um, but I don't know if there's, if there's anything mm -hmm. like specific, um, question. Mm -hmm. Keep I can, I mean, I can relate to what you're saying. Um, but more on a physical uh, sort of physical intuition where I know a lot of this started from my own struggles with my health and going to the doctors and telling them I was having weird reactions to medications or like they kept just dismissing my concerns. And it's like, no, I know something is wrong. And that's when I started looking into research because I'm this, you know, a teacher and an academic and like, I kept thinking, like, if I just do enough research, I'll figure out the answer because they're not listening to me. And that's when I started realizing that all of the tests that I could find, any research on Native people was primarily or only focused on addiction and diabetes. And if I didn't fit into one of those two things, then my concerns didn't exist. And it was, when, again, just kind of following that intuition of, like, feeling like, I know this is not. I know it's not one of those things. <laughs> like, I'm very frustrated because no one is listening to me. And it makes you feel very alone and and just struggling. And so trying to learn how to yeah, trust that voice within you and adapting that. So like I think there is this real like parallel between that, whether it's emotional stuff or physical. Well, on a completely different topic, um, we have a question about the lives and the afterlives of the objects themselves. Um, do you resonate with the ideas of animacy and the social lives of things? Does that connect in any way with the pieces that you made and talked about today? You want to go animate or intimate? Wait, what did you say? Animate. 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 I'm just thinking on it. I don't know if you, if yeah. you want to go first. Yeah. Um, I know I just had something to forget. <laughs> I wonder if I was just thinking about in relationship to the, the DNA, RNA, microarray analyses, those mm -hmm. tests are, are data that comes from yeah. a person's body, basically. Um, right. And it's their like abstracted genetic data, but you've turned it into a physical object again. Right. Yeah. And I, I remember that, I mean, that was a talking about supply chain thing. Like the tests even changed in the time that I first started this disease to or disease, this like project and the way that they map those diseases now, like within a couple of years, it changed already. And so like now I have to figure out how to go back and change things. But I remember you saying something about that um, before, Lara, about the having this physical object that even if tests aren't done that way anymore, there's always this physical record of it that translates back to an actual physical person and sees that there's it's always this map sort of back. And even though it's completely abstracted, it does connect to that one one person's body and that one test or one disease. And 
just um yeah, I love that sort of connection in history and talking about like this lives beyond this exhibition. I mean, like having those conversations, I mean, that's what so much of our artwork, at least for me, is trying to understand and connect to this world around me that I may or may not understand, but using my artwork to sort of process through those things and and try to make sense of stuff. So we're taking these really terrible, awful diseases and making them beautiful, <laughs> like trying to make them tolerable or a way that we can see them and connect to them. And like, you know, I've been working or talking with different um, medical research centers about possibly figuring out a way to use those to start more conversations, whether it's, you know, seeing having one researcher look at it and say like, maybe we need to change how we do research or not only do research on a very narrow group of people that like because i mean covid vaccines alone like realized that they were much stronger for women that they were reacted differently for different races or ethnicity groups like so I'm trying to think holistically <laughs> i guess i kind of just think about like objects and relationships to like museums and um just like how a lot of uh items are collected when they're meant to be used and in community um and just um i think like making work and being aware of like conservation and stuff but like sometimes sometimes like objects aren't meant to last forever you know they're meant to be touched they're meant to be used they're meant to um you know like i guess i kind of like think about that i don't know i gotta think about it in relation to the pieces but um yeah, that I mean, even starting those conversations, like when I was at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, where you had your blood quantum or family portrait mm -hmm. thing, where there was the three, it was interesting because I walked in the room and I overheard these two women, like one, they were both white women, and one was trying to explain this idea of blood quantum to the other and kind of stumbling over it. And then it's like, um, can, can I, <laughs> can I like, pipe in and but it started a conversation between the three of us like, and how complicated blood quantum is and how that relates to identity. And I mean, I think starting from that, like we're always thought of as this broken down blood quantum or like, so it's made sense to me to also see these DNA tests as like this broken down version of us where whether we're seen as data or seen as more than that data. And, and we're, we're close to time, and I wanted to ask one last question for each of you. Um, quick answer. If people want to see your work elsewhere other than at the Renwick, um, is there some place that we can see your work? Or what do you have coming up where people might be able to encounter your work? Um, I mean, I so I live in Minneapolis, so I... Um, I mean, just, I'm really active on social media, so folks can always follow me and see what's up um, through there. It's just Makwa Studio, but in terms of seeing work, I'm getting ready for an exhibition at Hair and Nails Gallery in Minneapolis, um, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, yeah. And um, also my website, like, I need to update, but <laughs> ericalore.com. And I know um, social media and stuff. I have, I work with a gallery in upstate New York. And then when here in Albuquerque, and I'm working towards shows. And I have, um, I think it's a print show. I wish, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the title of it, but it's a, a print and paper show that's happening in New York this weekend. And are you in a show in Minneapolis too, Erica? Oh, right. Yes. A, photogra <laughs> a photography show? <laughs> Yes, um, I'm part of the this um, indigenous photography exhibition. Um, oh my God, I'm blanking on the title of that too. Put on the spot, but it's opening this fall at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. Excited to be part of that. So Washington D.C. and Minneapolis are the places to be. Great, <laughs> and Santa Fe. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, Erica and Maggie. And thank you also to our audience and, and for the great questions that were um, given to us. Um, my 
closing remarks. Um, for news and updates from the Smithsonian American Art Museum, sign up for our newsletter at the link that's dropped into the chat. Please remember to complete the survey that will appear in your browser window after the program. Um, I also want to say that additional support has been provided by the Elizabeth Firestone Graham Foundation, the Lannan Foundation, the Robert Lehman Foundation, the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, Wingate Foundation, and Wyeth Foundation for American Art. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.